What do Joseph, the ancient Israelites, Peter, you and I all have in common? We'll find out on this episode of Straight Out of Context. This is going to ruffle some feathers. Welcome to the show, everyone. My name is Ash. This is Straight Out of Context. So, what do Joseph, the ancient Israelites, Peter, you and I all have in common? Well, it's the fact that God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. That's right. We're looking at Jeremiah 29, 11, and this would have to be one of the most misused, probably the most misused verse in all of Scripture. And easily so. I remember having this verse on a key ring when I was younger. Uh, I've seen them on uh, in picture frames, on Bible covers, on wall plaques, anything there, bumper stickers, you name it. This verse is is on there. It can bring great comfort to people from all over the world, regardless of their circumstance. Uh, This verse taken out of context can literally apply to any situation. When we isolate the text, we we see so much hope and wonder that we are made for more than what we may currently be facing. And and further than that, we can find ourselves applying it to, to finances yet again, another scripture that gets taken out of context to mean earthly prosperity. That's right, folks, if if you're poor right now, hold on to the promise that God has good plans for your future finances because Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us so. I admit that I have been that kind of preacher, less on the the financial side, but the more that everyone has this God-given destiny and use this verse for it, that there is purpose behind everyone and not to diminish that people uh, have purpose on life. You're not here by accident. You're here by design. Uh, our chief end is to glorify God and, in, and to enjoy Him forever, as the catechisms tell us. But uh, it's not like some, you know, he, God wants you to, to be a tech billionaire and, and lead the world out of poverty. He might, but that's not what this is really talking about. We we want to make sure that we don't fall into the trap of just diminishing anything that anyone ever says about these verses. Because even though scripture was written so long ago, we can still apply it if it's in its right context. We can still understand it and how it applies to our lives today. And that's what we're going to do with this verse. The problem with this teaching Uh, that I mentioned before that that can be quite dangerous. It leads to the common error that if you're suffering, you don't have enough faith. Uh, Like the faith, like faith is something that you can conjure up within yourself. Uh, You can turn it up to 11 uh, for all the spinal tap fans out there. Uh, It's something from within. It really becomes this, this law of attraction nonsense. I'd call it because it is nonsense. Uh, and, and sadly, we see that from very well-known preachers. Uh, we see this law of attraction, this positive vibes, good feeling, manifesting. Uh, those kind of words get thrown out there within the church from the pulpit. For some of these churches, I wouldn't even call it a pulpit. I'd call it a stage because they're entertaining goats. And what's sad is that, like all scripture, if it is read in its context, it does not lose any of its hope and its wonder, and it does not lose the glory that it gives God. And it gives us an opportunity to to be in awe of our God. Isolating any text gives us opportunity to to be in awe of ourselves, really. That's that's what it is. It, it, It honors us more than it honors God. So what is the context? Well, I'm glad you asked. In order to know what is being said in verse 11, we have to understand what kind of state uh, the nation of Israel is in at that time. As we look throughout the Old Testament, we see this back and forth 
with God's chosen people. God delivers them for a time. They're happy, they're obedient, and then they forget and they fall into sin and idolatry and they start mixing in things of the surrounding nations. This pattern happens quite a lot. And so after King Solomon dies, there's this split of the nation of Israel. The, the, the house of Israel is split into two kingdoms uh, after uh, Rehoboam becomes king. Uh, the people aren't happy. And so the northern kingdom becomes the, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom becomes the southern kingdom of Judah. And so the northern kingdom they go pretty quick. They get thrown into exile. They get, they get taken over by the Assyrians. And so the people of the, the kingdom of, of Judah, the southern kingdom, are still a little bit more okay. They're a little bit more obedient, but soon they fall as well. And here we find that they get conquered by uh, the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar. So... That is the history of what's going on by the time, or at the time of uh, Jeremiah the prophet writing this letter, writing uh, what is happening. He is letting them know that it's happening, it's going to come. And it is actually quite amazing what we see unfold in the whole of 29. Uh, but how full of hope and promise, uh, which we're going to get into it. So Jeremiah warns uh, Judah that they're going to get conquered and sent into exile. But they don't listen. He calls them to repent and they don't listen. This is the pattern that keeps happening. So now he speaks to the Israelites uh, in exile. They're torn from their nation and their homes are ripped apart, burnt down, pillaged, whatever it looks like. Think of how terrible it is. What you could imagine, it's probably worse than what you could imagine. And they've, they've shipped off to the other side of the known world. And now that they're foreigners, it could seem scary. It's daunting. The world looks pretty dim. It looks like God has forsaken them. God's chosen people have been forgotten and forsaken. But here is the beauty of God's sovereignty in this. Although the exile would be long, God promises that it will not be permanent. And that's a key part, that it's not going to be a permanent exile. In that time, they would see a lot of hardships. But God, in his faithfulness, would not destroy them completely. That is such a fear that, that they're going to be wiped out, that the name of Israel is not going to prevail, their household is not going to be known, all that kind of stuff. But God has other plans. And we understand that through Scripture, God is first and foremost concerned with himself and his glory. And so what we need to first understand is this is going to be a story about God's glory, his, his love, his justice, his faithfulness, more than it's about you and your circumstance. But we'll get to that. <laughs> they have to understand, and we have to understand, that they are a part of God's redemptive story, overarching redemptive story. From Genesis to, uh, to Revelation, we see this unfolding of redemption happening, and God hasn't finished with them in that plan. It's hard to see that uh, when when you don't have hindsight. We do. And so we can thank God that he is sovereign and he is faithful, even when we are not. So there'd be a day that God brings them back to the promised land. In fact, there would be blessing even in the exile, probably not in the ways that they would think about blessing. I mean, you look at your surrounding areas, you're a foreigner, you might not speak the language very well. Uh, you probably have some kind of breakdown of communication, customs are different, you're taken away from the synagogues, you're taken away from your places of worship, you're taken away from your families. It would be 
agonizing in some ways. It would be, you'd have anxiety, I could imagine, that that would fill your thoughts. Uh, but the fact is that they would be blessed during the exile. And that is what the promise in Jeremiah 29, 29 as a chapter is concerning. And what that means for your future, uh, I mean for the future of the ancient Israelites living in Babylonian exile. But we're going to start from verse 1 of Jeremiah 29, and then we'll read through to 14. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the Queen Mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisar, the son of Shaphan, and Gamariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. What's interesting to note is that we see this kind of, I don't want to say reversal, that makes it sound like God changed his mind, but we see this blessing here in the exile where God encourages the people to build houses, to marry, give their children in marriage, to, to, to multiply, be fruitful and multiply, to plant vineyards, and to seek the welfare of the city. Now, these blessings we see here were a curse in Deuteronomy 28 for their disobedience. So if, if reversal helps you understand it, but I don't want to say that God contradicts himself, uh, but he's, say, he's saying, well, I don't want to say he's saying, God is showing that he's continuously giving people that are disobedient, he's giving them blessing, he's giving them, giving them more than they deserve. For those who argue that the Old Testament doesn't show grace, that it's a different God from the New Testament, here is an example of grace being played out. The nation of Israel is rebellious time and time again. They are not the faithful party in this. God is. And so even in this, he is, he is suppressing the full weight of the curse that's found in Deuteronomy 28 for their disobedience and saying, so that you may prosper in the sense that you may not be 
diminishing as a people group, that you may, be, uh, you may still continue for my name's sake, go and be a part of the land. Not, not necessarily become a pagan and, uh, and do their customs, but marry, have children, grow produce, be a part of what's happening there. Pray for them above all of that, just like we should be praying for the land and our leaders and for the people within this land that we may call home uh, as we too are sojourning through and foreigners of, of this earth. Pray for them because their welfare is your welfare. That's what we're seeing unfold here in the, the words of Jeremiah 29. So what's the context of verse 11 specifically? What is the, the plans that God has for this people? Uh, plans to prosper and uh, for, their, for their good, for their welfare, for, uh, not for evil, not to harm them, but to, to prosper them. Well, God is faithful to his, provenant, uh, his promise to his covenant people that through, through the seed of Abraham, through uh, his offspring, the Messiah will come. And in order for that to happen, he is keeping them by his faithfulness so that they may not diminish and that line is broken. There is plans beyond their current prosperity and earthly welfare and well-being that they may not see yet, but again, we see in hindsight because we have the fullness of Scripture. So what's unfolded in, in the Old Testament, we're seeing brought to light in the New Testament. So how do we know what's going on here? Well, how do we know that this is for a people group in a specific time and place? Well, verse 10 tells us, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place, the promised land. Has this been fulfilled? Yes. It has been longer than 70 years since that prophecy was spoken. So yes, it has been fulfilled. How do we know it's fulfilled? Well, we can read Ezra Nehemiah to get more of that picture. Um, but it has been fulfilled. They're back in the land. They left exile a long time ago. What does it show, though? Although they were suffering in exile, God was not done with them. I've said it and I'll say it again. He wasn't done with them. He is the faithful party in this story. He is the faithful party in the whole redemptive story of Scripture. Not us. He is faithful to his promise. He calls them to be faithful and obedient during their suffering in a foreign land, even though he knows they haven't been before. He still calls them to obedience. He still calls them to faithfulness. Even though he is continuously faithful, he's not calling himself to being faithful. He's calling the rebellious party to be faithful, to come back faithfully, be obedient. You can see who is more this is about? I think we can. There was an element of obedience in this promise. So the Judahites uh, were to wait on the Lord, to trust in him and follow him while away from the temple and apart from uh, the priesthood and the sacrifices. So remember that they had all these things, that the ceremonial laws, civil laws, the mosaic laws. They just kept having these things that uh, they had to do. And so if you're not able to do that, uh, the example, I guess, it's probably a shallow example, but with all the lockdowns that we had and we couldn't meet in church and we had to stay home, it's like we couldn't do the sacraments, the Lord's Supper, things like that. It's, it's as if 
then we couldn't be a part of it because we were taken from the places of worship. But God is still calling people there to be faithful, even though they're away from all of that, because they can still be faithful to God and they can still be obedient to God's word, even when they are not going to church in that sense. So when they learned patience and obedience, he would bring them back. He assured them that he was near and able to restore them. We see that in uh, verses 12 to 14, when, when, uh, when they seek God, he will be found. And now we know in scripture that no one seeks after God. So again, who is faithful? God. He seeks them out. And so as they turn back to God, because he is still present and still there, they will find him. But people don't want to. <laughs> now, we cannot simply apply this verse directly to ourselves, which I'm the first to put my hand up. I have. I have let people know when I was a youth pastor, I preached on this uh, because it's what I heard. And again, it's not because I was faithfully studying the word of God in its context. I was isolating the verse because it is so full of hope and so full of uh, wonder. And I mean, our circumstances suck, right? Like we can have some pretty bad lives and yet God knows the plans he has for us. Well, that's, that's promising. That's reassuring that, that what I'm going to do in my life is better than than, than what's happening right now. I've just got to get through that breakthrough. Uh, these are the kind of things that I used to preach. So I'm the first to put my hand up. Every text that we look at in this show, I am the first to put my hand up and said, I was doing this wrong. I was using the scripture wrong. And so now that I see that, I try and help others that may see it wrong as well. I hope that it encourages people that way. So we can't apply this directly to ourselves, but it doesn't mean that we haven't benefited from this. It doesn't mean that it doesn't apply in some way, uh, but we just have to understand how it truthfully applies according to scripture. We are not the original audience. We are not who it was written for. In fact, we're not who any of scripture was written for, but that doesn't mean uh, in the sense of we weren't there at the time. But it doesn't mean that there isn't a flow-on effect uh, and a flow-on call, especially when it's a command of Scripture, uh, those kinds of things. It doesn't say, oh, it wasn't written for us, so we can palm it off. Uh, Ash said that we don't have to do that. It's not about that. But we have to understand in, in the context of Scripture, in the context of what is happening, this is a real historical account, a real historical event, that happened, and we have to see that it was fulfilled for a purpose. And we have to understand what that purpose was and how that purpose applies to us today. So we as Christians get this application, but not directly. Paul says of Jesus that all the promises of God Find their yes in him. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 1. All the promises of God are, are found their yes in him, in Jesus Christ. So, this is a fulfillment of some kind, of the glorious plans that God has for the people in Jeremiah 29.11. That is fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the true Israel, not a divided Israel like the two nations became, or the, the nation became, the two kingdoms became. He is the true Israel, the inheritor of all the promises made to the old covenant people. Ultimately, the promise of blessing during and after the exile in Jeremiah 29 11 was made to Christ, and it was fulfilled in his earthly sojourning as he too was a foreigner in a distant land, and his restoration to his heavenly dwelling, that is his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, where he now sits 
we inherit this promise as Christians by virtue of being grafted or united to Christ by faith. He has suffered the covenant curse and fulfilled the law of obedience on our behalf. We are not the faithful party. God is. We are not the ones that seek him. God seeks. And all that is his becomes our according to to the grace of God. We get it credited to our account. That doesn't mean we don't have an obedience now, but we understand that we don't get it to be, uh, we don't be obedient to get it. It's a free gift that now from that place we are obedient. We are faithful from that place. Uh, Not we be faithful to get blessings and receive everything that the world has to give. So while we suffer, and we do suffer, the suffering doesn't end once you become a Christian. It's, uh, there's just hope and purpose in the suffering, I would say, more than anything. Uh, it doesn't end when we become a Christian. But what we do see is that while we suffer here on earth, we are blessed through the work of the Holy Spirit. We will be raised one day in Christ and enjoy unspeakable blessing in the presence of our Lord, face to face. This is why knowing the gospel is so important. I was having a conversation with my wife uh, the other night about testimonies versus the gospel. Your testimony isn't the power unto salvation. The gospel is. But if we do not know the gospel and the glorious wonder and riches of the gospel, how are we ever going to share that with others so that they may too inherit all of the riches and fullness of God and seeing him face to face, unfathomable blessing, For God knows the plans he has for us that are found in Christ Jesus. You may not see a dime on this side of eternity. But for those who repent, just as Jeremiah called the nation of Israel to repentance, as we repent and trust in the name of Jesus Christ, There is an eternal blessing that is for our welfare, that is for our hope and joy more than anything else that could ever happen on this earth. We may end up poor and we may end up dead. We will end up dead. That's the reality. But when we see our Lord Jesus Christ face to face. This is ultimately what is meant by God's promise of plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. It's so much better than any promise of worldly prosperity. I want to finish by reading the rest of Jeremiah 29 because it's quite interesting how... It actually warns against false prophets. And I want you to to see what happens to false prophets, to those who come in the name of the Lord, who are not sent by him. And just think about what is coming for those. And this is why I, I take this so seriously. I was a pastor and I was preaching week in, week out. And ultimately, I was preaching lies. I don't think people understood it then, and I didn't understand it then. But the gravity of my actions and my words. I didn't go out to deceive people, but I didn't do my due diligence of studying the Word of God like I should have when I was put in charge of a flock. That's... That's what it comes down to. 
and the warning of what happens, of, of the judgment that will happen to those that come in the name of the Lord that are not sent. It just goes to show how faithful God is, how holy God is, and how he will not let anything happen to his people without justice happening. So we're going to read from verse 15. Because you have said, the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon. Thus says the Lord concerning the king who sits on the throne of David and concerning all the people who dwell in this city, your kinsmen who did not go out with you into exile. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I am sending on them sword, famine and pestilence, and I'll make them like vile figs that are so rotten they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with sword, famine and pestilence, and will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, to be a curse, a terror, a hissing, and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. Because they did not pay attention to my words, declares the Lord, that I persistently sent to you by my servants, the prophets, but you would not listen, declares the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord, all you exiles, whom I sent away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning Ahab, the son of Kaliah, and Zedekiah, the son of Messiah, who are prophesying a lie to you in my name. Behold, I will deliver them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall strike them down before your eyes. Because of them, this curse shall be used by all the exiles from Judah and Babylon. The Lord make you like Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. Because they have done an outrageous thing in Israel, they have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives, and they have spoken in my name lying words that I did not command them. I am the one who knows, and I am witness, declares the Lord. To Shemaiah of Nehalam, you shall say, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, You have sent letters in your name to all the people who are in Jerusalem, and to Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, and to all the priests, saying, The Lord has made you priest instead of Jeho Jehoiada, the priest, to have charge in the house of the Lord over every madman who prophesies, to put him in the stocks and neck irons. Now why have you have now why have you not rebuked Jeremiah of Anathoth, who is prophesying to you? For he is sent to us in Babylon, saying, Your exile will be long, build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. Zephaniah the priest read this letter in the hearing of Jeremiah the prophet. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, sent to all the exiles saying, Thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah of Nehalam, because Shemaiah had prophesied to you when I did not send him and has made you trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will punish Shemaiah of Nehalam and his descendants. He shall not have anyone living among this people, and he shall not see the good that I will do to my people, declares the Lord for he has spoken rebellion against the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. This is the warning. Now again, it's written to a specific people group in a specific time and a specific person. It's called out by name. But that shouldn't be a soft warning to the many Many people who stand in front of a congregation and declare that the Lord has told them to speak and they're making brothers and sisters in Christ trust in a lie. For God has not sent them. There is still judgment that will befall on them 
and justice for God's bride, for the bride of Christ will prevail. And that is something glorious that we long to see. But it does not mean that we shouldn't be concerned about this. We should be ever vigilant when it comes to who speaks on behalf of God. We should test everything against what Scripture says. We, we shouldn't do it in light of what our experience is or what the popular opinion is. We should do it in light of what Scripture says. And are these people who stand before the sheep, to stand before the bride that Christ will come back for and declare that God has told them to say something, we should concern ourselves with this. We should be vigilant. We should be like the Bereans and testing those preachers. We should test everything in light of Scripture. We should always be ready to warn the flock of those who come selling lies and false hope of earthly prosperity. I hope that as you reflect on this passage, I don't want to condemn anyone who has read this passage wrong. Again, I put my hand up first saying that was me. But I hope you see the true joy and hope and wonder and majesty of our God through what this scripture really means. Because it doesn't lose it. It actually shows it in its fullness when we read it in context. And anything short of that has been sold as a lie. And those preachers will have to face God for the words that they said God told them to say. I hope this has been an encouragement. I I don't want to keep going on the prosperity train, but it just seems like every verse gets taken out of context and made into some prosperity message. And maybe that's just how this will unfold. I don't know. Uh, but I do want to hear what your thoughts are and what verses you hear out of context. Please put them in the comments below because there are so many scriptures that get taken out of context. And I don't know them all. I just know what I've taken out of context. And so uh, I need your help. On, on this series, please let me know in the comments below uh, what scriptures you hear or you've heard taken out of context uh, and maybe share the story behind it as well. As always, uh, like, subscribe, ring that bell, share with others as well uh, so that they may be encouraged and give glory to our Lord Jesus Christ for everything that he has done and his faithfulness and his obedience not ours and not our rebellion. Just quickly before we finish, uh, I will have to slow these videos down. I can't do them as frequently. I'm back at work uh, now after five and a half months. So I thank God that I have work, uh, but it means that my timetable uh, will change for when I can record these. Uh, also, we've got babies coming in the next oh, five weeks. I don't know, it's go time. Uh, basically from any time now. It could basically happen. And so I do thank all of you who have been keeping my wife and I uh, in your prayers. God has been so gracious. He has given her uh, so much strength to carry these babies. And uh, I cannot wait to hold them in my hands, in my arms. I'm going to have to like hold them like footballs. Uh, that's another story for another time. Uh, I will sign off. Once again, I'm Ash. That was Jeremiah 29.11. And this is Straight Out of Context.